Alright guys, we're going to go ahead and get started with chapter 3. Okay, so before we can begin this, it's really important that you guys go back over chapter 2. Um, we will be discussing different molecules inside of the cell, and you really need to hammer down um, certain concepts like polarity, um, go back over the functional groups, and especially study over those four main macromolecules. Okay, and that being said, let's get started. All right, so the plasma membrane is going to be a really big deal, and we're going to hammer down um, each part of that, talk about why it's so important, um, talk about the different structures that really go into the, the plasma membrane. Um, so, right, we need to make sure that we understand that um, in terms of the clinical setting, like the PowerPoint says, we need to make sure that we understand the structure. Um, so that way, if you go into a clinical setting and you work with a patient, um, you're going to be working directly with those cells. Okay, so that's going to be very relevant for that. Okay, the cell theory. You need to know that the cell is the smallest unit of life. Okay, so we have atoms that are the smallest unit, but cells are the smallest unit for life. Okay. So recall that structure and function are complementary, okay? We went back over that on the first day of classes uh, when we talked about the structure of the small intestine and how the function of the small intestine is really reliant on the structure. And the structure um, is so refined to be complementary to the function, okay? Cells are the exact same thing. Uh, what's great about humans is that since we are a higher organism, we have a lot of different types of cells in our body. So think nerve cells, muscle cells, epithelial cells of your skin. Um, you know, all of those have evolved over time to become the best shape for the job. Okay. So um, one of the key things about cell theory is that cells can only arise from other pre-existing cells. Okay, so one epithelial cell came from one before that. Okay, uh, and we'll talk about cell division, so mitosis, meiosis, as well for that. Okay, so again, we have a lot of different types of cells, um, size, shape, components. Uh, there are going to be three main components that every type of cell has. Okay. Um, but besides those three main components, these cells are really diverse. All right, and this is just an example or a few examples of the different cells. Okay. All right. So human cells have three basic parts. You know, the plasma membrane. Okay, so that's going to be the boundary of the cell. The cytoplasm kind of holds all of the organelles in place. All right. Uh, and the nucleus, right? That's the control center for the cell. And it has our genetic codes, our DNA. All right, so whenever you're studying through this, what I really recommend you do, and this is also relevant for your next lab exercise as well, pre-lab four um, has you going through this, okay? Um, so what I would really recommend doing is drawing out each of these components. All right, and then writing out the definition for them as well. So what do they do? What's the function? What do they look like? Okay, that would be the best way to study for this. Okay, so extracellular materials. They are substances found outside cells. So extra, you can think external. Cellular means cells, okay? So we have different classes of extracellular materials or extracellular fluids, okay? Um, some people just refer to it as ECF, okay? So the extracellular fluids, right? We also have the interstitial fluid, so the cells are bathed in this fluid, okay? Um, some people just call that ISF, okay? We have the blood plasma, the fluid of the blood. So if you're squeezing, um, a pimple on your face and you squeeze out all the pus then you keep going um, you see the blood and then eventually the blood or the liquid that's coming out of that injury is no longer red anymore 
Instead, it's like this yellowish clear color. That's blood plasma. Okay. The cerebrospinal fluid is the fluid that surrounds the nervous system organs. It kind of acts as a cushioning for the brain and between the brain and the skull. Okay. Um, same goes for the spinal cord. Okay. So saliva, mucus, we have glands, okay, your parotid gland, for example, that makes mucus, or excuse me, saliva inside the mouth. Okay. Our cells, especially the cells in the back of our throat, um, some even our digestive tract, they secrete mucus. All right. So that could be um, an immune system response. So if we have a cold, our cells are making mucus to try to get whatever it is out of us. Okay, make a sneeze, all of that. Um, or it could be to facilitate the movement of a molecule or a particle uh, down our throats. Okay. Next, we have the extracellular matrix. So this substance acts as a glue that holds the cells together. Okay, so the plasma membrane um, acts as a barrier separating the eye. CF from the ECF. Okay. Um, the structure of this is going to be very significant. Okay. Um, some people call it the cell membrane, plasma membrane. Uh, we'll talk about it as the phospholipid bilayer. Okay. Um, all three of those mean the same thing. Okay. So uh, we have membrane lipids that form a lipid bilayer. Okay, so remember that lipids by nature are nonpolar. By nonpolar, that means that they're water fearing, they're hydrophobic molecules. Okay, um, the phospho part of the phospholipid bilayer, we have um, a glycerol group along with a phosphate group attached to that glycerol group. Okay, in that phospho head, um, is hydrophilic, meaning water-loving. So if you look at the diagrams for these, you'll see that the phospholipid head is facing both outside the head, or outside the cell for one layer, and inside the cell for the other, okay? It's facing that water, okay, or that water-based substances, right? We'll be looking at the different types of membrane proteins, okay, that go throughout this uh, lipid bilayer, okay? Um, the fluid mosaic model is going to be very significant, okay? I really recommend you go over that, draw it out, and make sure you understand each of the components, okay? So the surface sugars form the glycocalyx, all right? Uh, and we'll get into more detail about what that word means um, in a moment, okay? And then we have cell junctions, all right? We have three different types of cell junctions, that will be going in to in detail. All right, so this is what the fluid mosaic model looks like. You have a better quality in your textbook. Okay, but we'll be going through each of these components. Okay, a little bit more detail for that. Okay, so the lipid bilayer is made up of about 75% phospholipids, so we have the phosphate heads, like I mentioned, and the fatty acid tails. Um, whenever you're studying, you really need to understand uh, those specific components of the lipid bilayer. Okay, so 5% of the lipid bilayer is glycolipids. Okay, so glyco meaning sugar, all right, and lipids meaning fats, all right. So lipids with sugar groups on the outer membrane surface. Okay, so outer membrane surface, we're looking at um, facing the extracellular fluid. Okay, and next we have cholesterol. Okay, that increases membrane stability. All right, so if I put um, a diagram like this on your exam and ask you to label it, you need to be able to do that. Okay, this is a key component to making up the plasma membrane. 
So next, the membrane proteins. They allow cell communication with the environment. All right, so we're looking at the ECF here. All right, so uh, membrane proteins. We left off with cell communication. Um, they make up about half the mass of the plasma membrane. Okay, they have specialized functions. Uh, so it won't be changing shape. Okay, um, some fro float freely. Some are tethered. Okay, we have two types. Um, make sure you understand these two types. We have integral and we have peripheral. All right. Integral proteins, they're firmly inserted into the membrane. Most of them are transmembrane proteins, meaning that they'll go through both layers of that phospholipid bilayer. Okay, they have hydrophobic and hydrophilic regions, all right, which makes sense when you view it structurally. Okay, if you go back and you look at the phospholipid bilayer, recall that we had the hydrophobic parts for the lipid tails and we had the hydrophilic parts, which are. Um, those phosphate or phospho heads okay um so these transmembrane proteins will be right next to those nonpolar lipid tails and they'll also be facing directly inside the cell and outside the cell where they will meet a water-based environment okay um they function as transport proteins so channels and carriers we'll go more into detail about those enzymes or receptors. So enzymes are going to be a really big deal uh, when we talk about biochemistry um, along with the different function of the cell. Okay, Our cell would not be able to function properly if we didn't have uh, the function of enzymes to help. Okay, Next we have peripheral proteins. They're loosely attached to the integral proteins. They include filaments. Um, on the intra, so facing inwards towards the inside of the cell, okay, surface used for plasma membrane support. Okay, so proteins also serve to support. They serve for communication. They serve for enzymes. Um, they can change shape. Okay, um, they can help with cell to cell communications. Proteins do a lot of the heavy lifting of the cell. So transport, uh, here we can see some transport. Recall that these particles up here are called solute, right? Um, we'll be talking about the differences in the type of transport uh, that's occurring here, okay? The main takeaway that I want you to take from this slide is just knowing that we can bring molecules into the cell and we can put some out as well. It really just depends on what the cell needs. All right, so we have receptors. So these chemical messengers, okay, they are floating in the ECF, the extracellular fluid, okay? But they can bind on the binding site of this transmembrane protein, okay? They can bind to a binding site, which would be right here in this case. Um, and it makes the protein act as a receptor. So it can change the shape of the protein. Um, we can cause chemical reactions to occur. Or we could close off um, a chain of reactions and make them halt for the time being. Okay. All right. They can function as enzymes. All right. So remember that we're catalyzing, so we're lowering the activation energy. All right? The activation energy is the energy that's needed for a reaction to occur. All right, so to cell recognition. All right, we'll talk about the glycocalyx in a moment as well. But some of those glycoproteins, so glyco meaning sugar, protein meaning protein, <laughs> okay? Um, some of those are on the surface, all right, um, and they can be used to recognize other cells. So that becomes really important when you deal with recognizing foreign cells. So if you have bacteria that come into the system and they lack these glycoproteins or they just have a different type, that sends off some red flags uh, throughout the body, 
Okay, and that allows for the immune system to get involved. Okay, so next we have some attachment to the cytoskeleton and the extracellular matrix. Okay, so this really helps maintain the cell shape, um, fixes location of some proteins, helps with movement as well. Okay. All right, next we have cytosol jo joining. All right, so cell adhesion molecules, that's what these are called, or CAMs. All right, so that can help. We have binding sites here, all right? And when these binding sites are exposed, another cell can come through with a transmembrane protein and bind to this binding site of another cell, okay? All right, the glycocalyx, all right? This consists of sugars or carbs sticking out of the cell surface. Um, it's like a coat, okay? It's like a sugary coat that covers the cell, okay? So some of these sugars are attached to lipids, and they're called glycolipids, and some are attached to proteins, and those are called glycoproteins, all right? So it allows the immune system to recognize self versus self, or versus non-self, excuse me. Okay, so this is really good for cytosol recognition, which again is going to be a very big deal uh, whenever we talk about the immune system. Okay, so why is this important for a chemical standpoint? So the glycocalyx of some cancer cells can change so rapidly that the immune system cannot recognize the cell as being damaged. All right, so when you have the sugary coating that is changing so much and kind of um, reinvigorating itself almost. The immune system can't recognize that the internal framework of that cell is being damaged, okay? And when it's mutated like that and we have this constant changing going on, uh, which some bacteria do as well, um, and we have this constant changing, trying to kind of manipulate the immune system, uh, it's able to go forward and continue to divide uh, and reproduce inside that environment, okay? That's how some cancer cells um, spread throughout the body. Okay, so cell junctions. Some are free, so they're not bound to any cell. So uh, you can look at a video of blood cells flowing through the body. They're not hung up on any other type of cell, unless there's, for example, like a blood clot forming. Sperm cells are another good example of that, okay? So most are bound together to form tissues and organs, okay? Tissues we'll be talking about next week. Um, tight junctions, we have desmosomes and gap junctions as well. Okay, so I wanna start with going through um, these images first. So here, this is where the tight junctions would be, all right? So what do they do? So they're integral proteins, so integral, think transmembrane, okay? On adjacent cells, adjacent meaning next to, uh, fuse to form an impermeable junction that encircles the, ho the whole cell, okay? So impermeable meaning nothing can pass through it, okay? So it prevents fluids in most molecules from moving in between cells, which that's really good for those uh, tissues that have blood kind of going over their surface, right? You don't really want to get blood leaking into where it shouldn't be. Or you could think of something like stomach acid, so the epithelial cells that line your stomach, okay? You don't want that stomach acid fluid to be able to move in between those cells and potentially cause an infection. Okay, so desmosomes, they look like a zipper, okay, or like Velcro, right? And this is where they will occur. So right here, right, so anchoring junctions, they help keep cells from tearing apart. They're really good for those cells that um, undergo a lot of tension or a lot of stress, okay? So they interlock like teeth, like the teeth of a zipper. Okay, they can form plaques. All right, um, keratin is used uh, for these plaques. Um, intercellularly, inter, 
cellularly, uh, so meaning between two different cells, okay? Intra, meaning inside one, inter, meaning between two, okay? Uh, they're really good for allowing uh, tension to occur, okay? So think like your cardiac muscle cells, okay? Or think any of your muscle cells, right? Um, you don't want tearing to occur. And cardiac muscle cells undergo so much tension that they're kind of always at a risk of tearing. But these desmosomes prevent that from happening. All right, gap junctions. Okay. So we're going to be focusing here. All right, so we have the space between those cells. Okay. So we'll be focusing on these channels. So these are are also transmembrane proteins that form tunnels that allow small, small being the keyword here, molecules to pass from cell to cell. So ions, simple sugars, uh, other small molecules, electrical signals um, can also be passed quickly uh, between two cells. Uh, this example uses cardiac and smooth muscle cells, but we will also be reviewing over gap junctions when we talk about the nervous system. Okay. Um, we'll have ions being passed through there. Um, it's going to be very significant. Your muscle cells need to talk to each other, right? Especially your cardiac and smooth muscle cells. We have ions moving constantly uh, throughout the body. Uh, so sodium and potassium. We'll talk about the sodium and potassium pump, right? That needs to be activated, okay? And we need to have these ions moving back and forth. Right, and creating kind of a domino effect between these cells. Okay, so we have to have a lot of substances that are always passing through this plasma membrane. Uh, we'll talk about which ones can move easily versus the ones that can't. Okay, uh, the plasma membrane is selectively permeable, and that we can attribute to the structure of it, right? So that phospho head and that lipid tail are going to be key components as to what makes it selectively permeable, okay? So we have two different ways that substances can cross the plasma membrane. We have passive transport where we don't use any energy and we have active transport where we need energy, okay? All right, so passive transport. Again, no energy. That is a key takeaway from this section, okay? We have three different types. We have simple, facilitated, facilitated meaning it's helped by something, and osmosis. So all types involve diffusion, okay? Diffusion is movement of molecules from high concentration areas to low concentration areas. Um, you can think of this as moving down the concentration gradient, so high to low. Okay, you can also think of it like this, okay? If we're in the classroom and it's packed completely full of people, right? Our natural response to that would be to move to somewhere where there's not a lot of people, right? So we're moving from an area of high concentration of people to an area of low concentration of people. That is moving down a concentration gradient. So why does this happen? Okay, so all molecules um, are always moving. Okay, they have a really high speed of movement just based on um, their properties. Okay, so movement happens, collisions are a result of that movement. Okay, so uh, if you're in a crowded environment with a high concentration of people, you're more likely to be bumping into other people, right? So molecules in a higher concentration area will collide more, um, which will make these molecules eventually scatter out into those lower concentration areas. Okay, so this is just an example of diffusion. Um, one of the examples that we use in one of the labs is to take Febreze and to just spray it in the air and it'll diffuse out, right? Okay, so diffusion, 
Um, the fusion and the rate of a chemical reaction are influenced by similar factors. Okay, so for diffusion, the greater the differences of concentration between the two areas, the faster this diffusion occurs. Okay, you're having more collision between these molecules happen, and more collisions mean more movement to lower concentration areas. Um, for molecular size, recall back to chemical reactions. We said that reactions happen faster when the molecules participating are smaller. Same thing happens with diffusion. Smaller molecules will diffuse faster. Okay? So, uh, with temperature, the higher the temperature, uh, the faster diffusion will go. Okay? Higher temperatures, we have an increase in kinetic energy, which results in faster diffusion. So, kinetic energy, think movement. Okay? So, on your exam, we're going to talk about the differences between passive or potential energy and kinetic energy. Okay? So, make sure you're aware of that. Right? So, equilibrium is reached when there is no net movement of molecules in one direction only. So what do I mean when I say net movement, right? So molecules, even at equilibrium, they're always moving, right? So if we go back to our people example, um, we can have an equal number of people inside the classroom and out of the hallway, but we might have some that are just kind of going back and forth, right? We're going back and forth, but the classroom doesn't have more people in it, and the hallway also doesn't have more people in it, right? Equal number, but we still have movement. Okay. So, molecules want to move down their concentration gradients, but the hydrophobic lipid tail stops that, okay? Um, it's very picky about what type of molecules it allows through, and it has a lot to do with polarity, okay? Remember that water is polar, but lipids are nonpolar. Okay? So these are the molecules that can passively diffuse. So passively meaning no energy required. So those that are lipid soluble or nonpolar, okay? Same kind of thing here. Um, if the lipids like it, okay, molecule will be allowed through. Right? If it's very small and it can pass through the membrane or membrane channels, so remember that the channels will be those transmembrane proteins. Okay? Um, so water is able to pass through that plasma membrane. Okay? And that would be simple diffusion. Okay, so larger or non-lipid soluble or polar molecules can cross the membrane, but only with the assistance of carrier molecules. So that is facilitated diffusion. When you facilitate someone, you help them, okay? Um, again, because the phospholipid bilayer has such a large lipid component, if a molecule is non-lipid soluble, it's going to have to find another way to go through that bilayer. Um, again, the lipid component is also nonpolar, so larger polar molecules will also have some difficulty in crossing through that phospholipid bilayer. Okay. Um, osmosis, we'll be talking more about that in detail. So here we're only looking at the movement of the solvent, which is typically water, um, especially when dealing with cells inside of the body. Okay, so what happens when the plasma membrane is severely damaged, right? Um, when we have that damaging, substances are able to go in and out of the cell uh, without a lot of monitoring taking place, which really messes with the concentrations of the solutes in the extracellular fluid and inside the cell as well. And that causes a big change, um, a very dramatic change in those concentration gradients. So burn patients, part of the reason that um, they become so sick, so ill, is because their cells are weeping out all of these fluids from their cell membranes. All right, so simple diffusion. Just to recap that, um, nonpolar lipid-soluble substances are able to go directly through 
okay? Recall that this does not involve any energy, okay? Uh, small amounts of very polar molecules um, or small amounts of polar molecules uh, can pass through this, this phospholipid bilayer without having any issues, um, but they have to be very small. So water only has three atoms uh, included in this compound, so it can pass through relatively easily. So this is what simple diffusion looks like. One of the key things that I really want to point out here is the differences in the solute concentration outside of the membrane, so in the extracellular fluid, and inside the cell. So we're moving down a concentration gradient here. Okay, so facilitated diffusion. Uh, here we're looking at hydrophobic molecules. Um, they can travel through this bilayer by doing carrier-mediated facilitated diffusion or channel-mediated facilitated diffusion. Okay, and we'll go a little bit more into detail about the differences between those two. Okay, so carriers are transmembrane integral proteins. So recall that transmembrane integral proteins span through both layers of the phospholipid bilayer of the plasma membrane. Okay, so these are very specific. Um, they change shape whenever this molecule goes into this carrier. All right, they're binding to the carrier. Um, which causes the carrier to change shape, okay? So these molecules are entering in from the extracellular fluid, um, going into that transmembrane protein, okay? Uh, binding, and that binding causes a change of shape, okay? Um, carriers can become saturated. So when all of the carriers that are present in the phospholipid bilayer um, are bound to molecules, no more can pass through the phospholipid bilayer until those carriers have completed um, moving the molecules that are inside of them to the inside of the cell. Okay, so if they're all busy, no more solutes in the extracellular fluid will be able to move to the inside of the cell. Okay, and here is an image depicting that. Okay, so make sure that you're aware that lipid insoluble solutes, okay? So here, these are lipid insoluble, this looks like glucose, okay? Um, we'll go into this carrier, all right? And you can see that this carrier is very molded, uh, very specifically shaped to let in glucose, okay? You can see here that this shape looks a lot like glucose, okay? So it'll go in, all right? And as this protein releases the solute, um, a shape change occurs. Okay, so versus channel mediated facilitated diffusion. So channels are filled with water, all right? So that's what the aqueous filled cores mean. Um, here, uh, we're still dealing with transmembrane proteins. So transmembrane proteins are the membranes that span both layers of the phospholipid bilayer, okay? And these channels are going to be filled with water. One of the key differences between a channel versus carrier is that carriers change shape to fit that solute. Channels do not, okay? Channels simply transport molecules down their concentration gradient. All right, so instead of us changing, being very specific to the molecule, uh, these channels really just care about how big the solutes are, okay? If the solutes aren't even able to fit through the channel, then they won't be going through the channel, okay? Water channels are called aquaporins, okay? That is key here. Most of these, well, a lot of these channels will be carrying water through, okay? Here we have two different types of channels. We have leakage channels, which are always going to be open, and gated channels that are going to be controlled mainly by the concentration of ions inside and outside the cell. Okay, and here is a diagram for that. So here we have small lipid insoluble solutes, right? You can look at this transmembrane protein and see that we do not have any shape changes going on here, all right? Versus what we saw with the carrier-mediated facilitated fusion. All right, and again, we're moving down the concentration gradient, so that is key here. 
Okay. Osmosis. Osmosis will only refer to the solvents. Okay. So think like water. All right. Uh, water will be diffusing either through simple diffusion. Okay. So recall that water, even though it's polar, it's so small that it can go through um, those little bit tails. Okay. Uh, some water will go through the aquaporins. Okay. So aquaporins um, just work with moving water. Okay. So here, instead of us really moving down a concentration gradient, any time that there's a difference in the amount of solute, okay, or excuse me, the amount of solvent on either side of that phospholipid bilayer, uh, we're going to be looking at moving it, okay, moving that solvent, okay. So not focus too much on moving against or down the concentration gradient. If there's a difference, we're going to have movement. So here you can see that osmosis in this example is occurring with a large amount of solvent of water on the outside of the cell. And this aquaporin is working to move those water molecules down. But we also have just simple diffusion that is also working to move these water, these water molecules through the phospholipid bilayer. Okay, so how can we really measure that? So recall back to whenever we talked about molarity. Here we have osmolarity, okay? So we have the measure of the concentration of the total number of solute particles in solvent, okay? So um, just to go through this, all right, so water moves by osmosis from, layer, from areas of low solute concentration to areas of high solute concentration, okay? So you can see by kind of reading through that, that that might not be going down the concentration gradient for water itself, right? So instead, we're kind of looking at the solute concentrations. If there's low solute and we're trying to establish equilibrium, okay, we're going to move some of that water and move it down, okay, to the areas of high solute concentration, right? Try to even out the amount of water there, even though it's moving against its own concentration gradient. Okay, so just to kind of go back through this, um, we're going to have diffusion of solutes coming through, osmosis of water coming through, okay, until we have an equilibrium established. So one of the things that I want you to really pick out from this is that with equilibrium, we're always having movement, okay? We're going to have movements of solutes, movement of water. We're still going to have movement of those molecules, but overall, we're still going to have the same concentration of both things on both sides. Okay. All right. So here's a really good example for that. So you can see from looking at this that we're trying to establish an equilibrium here. Okay. So we have more solutes over on the right hand side, right? So these solutes to establish equilibrium will be moving towards the left hand side. All right. And because we have more solutes on the right hand side, we have less water. Okay. So to establish an equilibrium with water, since we have more on the left hand side, we'll be moving that over to the right hand side. Okay. And that will establish an equilibrium. Now, this can only occur if our membrane is fully permeable, okay? If it's semi-permeable, uh, solutes won't be able to move through, and it won't, equilibrium can't be established like this. Okay, so just to go through this real quick, uh, water will have net movement across the membrane until osmolarity, okay? So that's a measure of concentration, is the same on both sides. All right, so we're going to have a change in volume. All right, so remember whenever we talked about solids, liquids, and gases, uh, water will have this, hold on, <laughs> water will have the same volume, okay, overall. I'm actually not going to say that. Never mind. Okay, anyways, um, whenever we have this movement of water, 
it results in volume changes on both sides. All right. So the low solute side will have less volume of water. Okay. The high solute side will get more, right? We're trying to establish the equilibrium of water here. All right. Uh, and this situation occurs when that membrane is not permeable to the solute. Okay, so this is what that would look like. Okay, so again, we have more water on this side and less solutes. Okay, but we have more solutes on this side and less water. Okay, water still wants to establish equilibrium. Okay, get the same amount of water on both sides. So now we have that. Okay, so we have a lower amount of solutes. We have a lower amount of water, we have a higher amount of solutes, and a higher amount of water, okay? So even though this looks like a drastic change, we have the same amount of water on this side and the same amount of water on this side as well, okay? And this is a selectively permeable membrane, meaning that the solutes here um, are not being able to move through this membrane, okay? So when we have this movement of water, it does involve pressures, right? So we have two different kinds. We have hydrostatic pressure and we have osmotic pressure. So hydrostatic pressure is outward pressure exerted on the cell side of the membrane. So you can think of it as the internal side of the membrane that's caused by increases in the volume due to osmosis, okay? So if we have more solutes inside of the cell, the cell will be taking on water, right? If we put a cell in a solution that has solutes in it, okay, but the cell itself has more solutes in it than the solution does, then water will still be trying to establish um, its own equilibrium and it will be moving to the inside of the cell. Okay, and that's going to be that hydrostatic pressure, that outward pressure that's exerted by that gain of water while it's trying to establish an equilibrium um, is that hydrostatic pressure. Okay, so osmotic pressure is inward pressure due to the tendency of water to be pulled into a cell with higher osmolarities. Okay, so the more solutes inside a cell, the bigger the pull on water to enter. Okay. So, uh, like I mentioned before, when we talked about hydrostatic pressure, when a cell has a lot of solutes inside of it, okay, and it's in a watery solution with water as a solvent, if that cell has a good amount of, or a large amount of solutes inside of it, water still wants to establish an equilibrium, okay? Water wants to be equal both inside the cell and outside the cell. So that inward pressure of water trying to go into that cell with all of those uh, solutes, that's osmotic pressure, okay? Okay, so when hydrostatic pressure equals osmotic pressure, no further net movement of water occurs, okay? So remember when we talked about net concentration, net movement, uh, we're talking about a situation in which we still have movement occurring but the majority of water isn't moving out and the majority isn't moving in. It's a nice equilibrium going on here. So one side isn't gaining more water or losing more water than the other side. Uh, now we're at an equal concentration. So plant cells have strong cell walls that act to limit the hydrostatic pressure levels, which in turn also limits osmotic pressure. Okay. Um, plant cells, they're a lot stronger than we are, uh, or our cells are, so we don't have cell walls. Um, so our cells can take in too much water, okay? If you drink too much water and you fill up um, your body with all this excess water, you can give yourself water poisoning, essentially. Um, and what happens to your cells is that they can't help but to take in all of that water, okay? because they're still trying to establish that equilibrium, you're taking in too much water and the cells don't have a choice. They have to take in that water, okay? And that will make them burst, all right? In the event that you're dehydrated, okay? You don't have enough water. Um, 
the water inside of the cells will start to leave, right? To kind of still establish that concentration uh, equilibrium, okay? So when that happens and your, your cell is losing water, it shrinks, okay? So changes in cell volume can disrupt cell function, right? If your cell gets too bloated, it won't be able to act the same way that it typically would. Okay, so for this, what I want you guys to really focus on is the differences between isotonic, hypertonic, hypotonic, okay? Isotonic, we have equilibrium established. The cell isn't taking on water, all right? And it's also not losing water. Hypertonic, okay? For this, we have a higher osmolar osmolarity inside the cell, okay? So here, if we have a low amount of solutes inside the cell, right? If we have a low amount of solutes inside the cell, but we have a higher amount of solutes outside the cell, water will still want to establish that concentration equilibrium of water. So because your cell has more water than the outside of it, water is going to go out, okay? And that cell is going to shrink. Okay. Hypotonic solutions. Uh, we have more solutes inside of the cell than we do outside. Okay. So because of that, we have more water outside the cell than we do inside. Water wants to move um, to establish equilibrium to get concentrations equal on both sides of the cell. Okay. Um, so more water outside, less water inside. Water is going to be moving inside the cell, okay, towards that lower concentration of water, which will make the cell start to swell, okay? And that's referred to as lysing. Okay, so here's just a little bit of math here, all right? So osmolarity is equal to molarity, so molarity being concentration, uh, times the number of ions or particles. All right, and they give a good example here with NaCl, okay? Um, it's also expressed as osmols over liter, and the liter is for liters of solvent, okay? All right, so this is a really good example um, of what happens in these different uh, tonic solutions, okay? All right. All right, moving in to part two of chapter three. Okay, so we left off covering passive transport. Now we will focus on active transport. So we have two different types of active membrane, membrane transport processes. We have active transport and vesicular transport, okay? So the main concept of active transport is that we need ATP, okay? And ATP is what the cell uses for energy, okay? So um, when do we use active versus passive? So we'll use active if the solute is too large for channels, not lipid soluble, or not able to move down the concentration gradient. Okay, so active transport, we need carrier proteins, so solute pumps. So remember, that the carriers that we use for passive can also be used for active. So carrier proteins are transmembrane integral proteins. Okay, these are embedded in the membrane and they, sp they spread across both layers of the phospholipid bilayer. So they bind specifically and reversibly, so meaning that they can unbind with the substance being moved. Okay, so some carriers can transport more than one substance. We have anaporters and symporters. So anaporters can travel or can transport two different types of substances, okay? So we can have one substance that's going out of the cell into the extracellular fluid and another substance that's going into the cell. Symporters, we have two different substances, but they're either both going inside the cell or both going outside the cell into the extracellular fluid. So here we have solutes that are moved against their concentration gradient. So whenever it is moving against, we're moving from an area of low solute concentration to an area of high concentration, okay? And this does not happen without the use 
of energy. Okay, so we have two different types of active transport. We have pr primary active transport and secondary active transport. So primary active transport, um, we need to have ATP hydrolysis take place. So recall that hydrolysis is producing water as a product, or excuse me, it's using water as a reactant, and it's breaking down um, a larger molecule, and in this case it would be ATP, down into smaller molecules. Okay, so typically when hydrolysis occurs, we start off with ATP, use water as a reactant here, okay, and that would yield what we call ADP and a phosphate group, a free phosphate group. And the breaking of that bond um, makes energy, okay, it's a very volatile um, bond there, okay. So secondary active transport, the required energy is obtained indirectly from ionic gradients created by primary active transport. So I think that secondary active transport is the is best explained by looking at the diagrams. Okay, so to go a little bit further into primary active transport, one of the most common pumps that we'll be talking about is the sodium potassium pump. Okay, so here we're moving two different substances across or against a concentration gradient okay so um, the energy from the hydrolysis of ATP remember hydrolysis water as a reactant being used to break down a larger molecule into something smaller um, so energy from that hydrolysis causes change in the shape of the transport protein in this case again we'll be using the transmembrane integral proteins that are acting as carrier proteins Okay, so we're having a shape change here. Um, like we mentioned with the carrier mediated facilitated diffusion, that same or similar shape change can happen again with primary active transport. So the shape change causes solutes bound to the protein to be pumped across the membrane. Okay, the sodium potassium pump will be very relevant whenever we talk about action potentials in neurons. Okay, and that'll be in chapter 14. Okay, going a little bit more into detail about the sodium potassium pump, um, it's a protein, okay? The pump itself is a protein. Uh, recall that enzymes are proteins, so it's basically an enzyme, okay, called sodium potassium ATPase. One of the things that I want you guys to really notice about enzymes is that all of them end in the same three letters, A-S-E. So we have sodium potassium ATPase, we have lipase that we'll talk about soon, uh, and we have lactase, so what breaks down lactose, okay? So all those enzymes have the same ending. But with this one, um, the sodium-potassium pump pumps sodium out of the cell and potassium back into the cell, okay? And these two ions are being moved against their concentration gradients, okay? So, this pump is located in all plasma membranes, but especially active in excitable cells. So, nerves and muscles will be what we really focus on when we talk about sodium-potassium pumps. So, leakage channels. Remember that leakage channels are always open, okay? So, leakage channels located in the membranes result in the leaking of sodium into the cell and leaking of potassium out of the cell, okay? Here we have them, they're moving down their concentration gradients. But the ATP pump, a different protein, works as an antiporter that pumps sodium out of the cell and potassium back into the cell against their concentration gradients. Okay? So first, whenever we're first moving sodium and potassium, we're using leakage channels. These are always open. Okay? And no energy is needed to travel across these leakage channels. But when we use the sodium potassium pump, we do need energy here. Okay? Because both of these ions, both sodium and potassium, are moving against their concentration gradients. So uh, we have the maintenance of electrochemical gradients, um, which involve both the concentration and the electrical charges of ions. Okay, so the concentration of sodium potassium and the electric charges of both of those, in this case, they each have 
a plus one charge, okay, so a positive one charge. Um, they're going to be very important when we talk about the functions of muscle and nerve tissues. Okay, so here's kind of breaking everything down. Okay, so this is talking specifically about the sodium potassium pump. Okay, I really recommend that you go through and you review this uh, figure that's in your textbook because the one that's provided on the PowerPoint slide is not very high quality, but you have the same figures in your textbook. Okay, so just working through the steps. We have three cytoplasmic, so cytoplasmic meaning it's from the cytoplasm, okay, which is inside the cell. So three cytoplasmic sodium ions bind to the protein pump or the pump protein, okay. So the second step, we have sodium binding that promotes the hydrolysis of ATP. So hydrolysis, again, here we're taking ATP. This is our big molecule. We're using water as a reactant, okay? When that hydrolysis of ATP occurs, we're now left with the products of ADP and phosphate. Now, ADP and ATP will make a lot more sense once we actually look at the overall structure of both of those molecules, okay? And we'll talk about ATP in a little bit more detail, uh, talk about how that energy breaking really, or how that bond breaking really creates a lot of energy okay so the energy that's released during the hydrolysis of ATP phosphorylates the pump okay so like I recalled earlier or like I mentioned earlier we have ATP that is our big molecule here all right when it undergoes hydrolysis it is now ADP in a free phosphate group so now this free phosphate group is going to the pump Okay, that's what we mean by phosphorylation. Okay, the addition of a phosphate group. Okay, so phosphorylation causes the pump to change shape, which expels the sodium to the outside. Okay, so that phosphate group will come in, attach to the pump, cause a shape change. All right, and that makes the sodium that was bound to the pump go outside the cell. Okay. So step four, we have two extracellular proteins or extracellular potassiums bind to the pump, okay? Bind to this protein pump, all right? And one of the things that I want you to notice as we go along is how they're moving against their concentration gradient, okay? Against concentration gradient, we need energy, okay? So step five, this potassium binding triggers the release of the phosphate so remember, when we had ATP hydrolysis, we were, we were left with ADP and a free phosphate group. Now that free phosphate group binded to the pump, to the sodium potassium pump. Okay, so now we have potassium coming in, binding to that pump, which triggers the release of the phosphate group from that pump. Okay, we have dephosphorylation happening now. So the dephosphorylated pump resumes its original conformation. Okay, so we had a shape change happen, but now that the phosphate group has left, okay, due to potassium binding, now it's back to its original shape. All right, the last step. The pump protein binds ATP and releases potassium to the inside of the cell, okay, and so but, and sodium sites are ready to bind sodium again, and this cycle just keeps repeating, okay? So you can see how we have this movement against concentration gradients. So we started off with a higher concentration of sodium in the extracellular fluid. This ATP pump is pumping more, okay? Pumping more out into the extracellular fluid from inside of the cell, okay? For potassium, we start off with a lot inside the cell, but now we're adding even more to inside the cell. Okay, so how does this differ from secondary active transport? So secondary active transport depends on the ion gradient that was created by the primary transport system. So how this kind of works is 
we have all of this binding, all of this protein shape changes happening with the sodium potassium pump. Now we can have other molecules that are kind of attracted to this almost, right? So they're able to just kind of tag along with sodium as it's going into the cell, okay, in through these carrier proteins, and they're just all going into the cell, okay? So sodium here, all right, sodium here is coming in, okay? No, it's not. Sorry. Anyways, so with sodium, sodium is flowing through the carrier proteins, right, in the membrane, um, and other molecules are able to just flow into the cell with it as it's moving, okay? All right, and this is a really good image for this, okay? So here we have primary active transport, right? We have the sodium potassium pump here, okay? We have ATP being used, so we have a steep concentration gradient being established here. For secondary active transport, as sodium is kind of moving back into the cell after being pumped out by the sodium potassium pump, it's bringing molecules with it, okay? So in this case, we have a co-transporter, all right, that is able to take in sodium and glucose, okay? So sodium is kind of the driving factor here, all right? So because of the concentration gradient that we have established in primary active transport, we can bring in glucose as sodium is trying to go back, okay? And try to establish equilibrium, all right? Okay, so vesicular transport involves the transport of large particles, macromolecules, and fluids across the membrane in membranous sacs called vesicles, okay? Recall that this is another form of active transport, so we need energy in the form of ATP. Okay, so we have two different types. So we have endocytosis and exocytosis. So if we break these words down, endo meaning inside, site is meaning cell, okay? So endocytosis, inside the cell, okay? Or into the cell. Exocytosis, exo, you can think of exiting, okay? So exo meaning exit, site meaning cell, we're exiting the cell. Okay, so um, we also have some other types. Uh, these two, endocytosis and exocytosis, those are the main ones that I really want you guys to focus on. But we also have transcytosis and vesicular trafficking. Okay, so we have three different types of endocytosis. We have phagocytosis, pinocytosis, and receptor-mediated endocytosis. So let's go ahead and provide a little bit more details here. Okay, so endocytosis, we have the formation of protein-coated vesicles. Okay, they usually involve receptors. It can be very selective because of those receptors. All right, so we have these binding sites for these receptors. Okay, so these receptors will have these binding sites where a substance is supposed to bind to it. Okay. And if it doesn't fit, it won't be able to go into the cell, okay? So some pathogens are capable of hijacking receptor for transport into the cell, okay? So uh, one of the really interesting cases that I want you guys to take away from this is by the bacteria, by the bacteria that causes meningitis, okay? It has a really interesting process of how it enters into the body, and it has to do some with endocytosis, okay? So, once the vesicle is pulled inside the cell, it may fuse with the lysosome, which we'll talk about, is essentially like the waste disposal system of the cell, okay? Or it undergoes transcytosis. So, this is just a step-by-step, -step, kind of going into everything, okay? So, here we have a protein coat. We have some solutes here. Okay, so the coated pit ingests the substance. This is our coated pit. 
Okay, so the protein-coated vesicle detaches here. Okay, you can see where it's attaching. All right, so these vesicles are losing some of those proteins. All right, so the uncoated vesicle fuses with a sorting vesicle caught an endosome. Okay, so here we have this fusion taking place. All right, so the transport vesicle containing membrane components moves to the plasma membrane for recycling. Okay, the cell itself is very good at what it does. Okay, so it's very good at taking care of itself. All right, and that's where those transport vesicles come into play. A lot of the things that occur inside of the cell, they're very cyclical. Okay, very cyclic. All right, and this is a great example here. So step six, our last step, the fused vesicle may fuse with the lysosome, so over here, for digestion for, of its contents or deliver its components to this plasma membrane on the opposite side of the cell, which is transcytosis. Okay, so trans, we're going from one side to the other. Okay, and this is just kind of going into everything. Okay, so phagocytosis. Uh, this is really interesting whenever we talk about how an animal cell came to be what it is now. Um, yeah, so we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get a little bit into evolution. But one of the main kind of theories behind how an animal cell came to be how it is now is a bigger cell performed phagocytosis on a smaller cell. And that smaller cell, instead of being digested by the cell, instead it became specialized and eventually became something like the mitochondria. Okay, it's a really interesting um, theory. But what is phagocytosis? So it's a type of endocytosis referred to as cell eating. Okay, so we have membrane projections called pseudopods, pseudo meaning fake, okay, called pseudopods form and flow around solid particles that are being, that are being engulfed forming a vesicle which is pulled into the cell. So this foreign vesicle is called a phagosome. Phagocytosis is used by mac macrophages and other white blood cells. Okay, so we'll get into the immune system when we get more into blood. Um, but whenever we have a foreign bacteria or a foreign substance, some of our immune system cells are able to perform phagocytosis and clear those out. Okay, so the phagocytic cells move by amoeba motion. Okay, so like an amoeba, where the cytoplasm flows into temporary extensions that allow the cell to creep. So if you look up something like an amoeba, how it moves, these cells move in a very similar way. All right, so this is a diagram of phagocytosis. Um, the cell engulfs a large particle by forming the by forming a projecting pseudopod, so false foot. Another thing about that structure that um, you guys might notice if you do some outside research is that some protists also have a pseudopod that they use to move around. Okay, um, so the cell is engulfing that large particle, is enclosing it within a membrane sac, which is called the phagosome. The phagosome combines with the lysosome and its contents are digested. And the vesicle has receptors that are capable of binding to microorganisms or solid particles. So think something like bacteria um, or other microorganisms similar to that. Uh, the vesicle has those receptors that can bind those bacteria uh, to it and then it can be engulfed. Okay, so penocytosis. This is a type of endocytosis that's referred to as cell drinking. Um, so how does this occur? The plasma membrane enfolds, which brings in the extracellular fluid and dissolved solutes from inside the cell. Um, this is just to get a general feel for the environment. You know, what kind of solutes do we have? Uh, what's the concentration of those solutes? Uh, so on and so forth. So this is used by some cells to sample the environment. Um, this is present in the small intestine, okay? Um, 
I like talking about the small intestine because it really shows a lot about the nutrient absorption. Um, that is where all of our nutrients are absorbed, okay? And they do so by performing penocytosis. So membrane components are recycled back to the plasma membrane. Okay, and so this is what that looks like. We don't have any receptors, so this process is not as specific as phagocytosis is. Okay, so receptor-mediated endocytosis. This involves endocytosis and transcytosis of specific molecules. So recall that transcytosis is bringing materials in from one side of the plasma membrane, traveling it through the cell, and spinning it out the other side of the cell. Okay, so many of these cells have receptors embedded in clathrin coated pits. Um, these will be internalized along with the specific molecule that is bound to the receptors. Okay, so um, we do have some unfortunate uh, organisms or toxins that can be binded to these receptors. Okay, so viruses, uh, certain toxins as well can be taken into the cell um, through these receptors. Okay. So uh, we have the clavulae that have smaller pits and different protein coats from clathrin, but still capture some specific molecules and use transcytosis. All right, so this is what that looks like. We can see that we have solutes here, um, some substances. We have these receptors, okay? And now the substances are being uh, transported inside by this vesicle. Okay, exocytosis. Exocytosis is the process where material is ejected from the cell. It's usually activated by cell surface signals or changes in the membrane voltage. Um, so membrane voltage, we'll talk a lot about resting membrane potential. Okay, so the substance being ejected is enclosed in the secretory vesicle. The protein on the vesicle is called a V snare, which makes sense because V meaning vesicle um, and snared as being the name of the protein. So the V-snare finds and hooks up to the target T-snare, so target snare proteins on the membrane. And this process triggers exocytosis. Okay, so hormones, cellular waste. We don't want to keep cellular waste inside the cell, so they need to be um, ejected somehow from the cell. Uh, we also have neurotransmitters and mucus that are also um, exiting these cells. Okay, so going into the process. Step one of this process, the membrane brown vesicle migrates to the plasma membrane. Step two, the proteins at the vesicle surface, um, which again are these snares, bind with the target cells, or the target snares, okay? Um, and those are attached to the plasma membrane. Step three, the vesicles and the membrane fuse and the pore opens up. Okay. You can also see by looking down here at the diagram that as they fuse together, they're also kind of pulling apart, Okay, and that is where that fusion pore is formed. Alright, so step four, the vesicle contents are then released to the exterior. Okay, so those contents are now being released into the extracellular fluid. Okay, and this is an image of what exocytosis looks like. Okay, resting membrane potential. This is the electrical potential energy produced by the separation of oppositely charged particles across the plasma membrane in all cells. So for these, we'll be looking at the movement of specifically potassium, okay? So the difference in electrical charges between two points is, refer is referred to as a voltage, okay? Cells that have a charge are said to be polarized. This voltage only happens at the membrane surface, so next to the bilayer. Um, the rest of the cell and extracellular fluid are neutral, okay? Membrane voltages range from negative 50 to negative 100 millivolts in different cells. Uh, we'll be looking at muscle cells. We'll be looking at neurons, especially when it comes to dealing with resting membrane potential. Okay, so potassium. I already mentioned that we'll be dealing a lot with potassium when it comes to talking about the resting membrane potential. So potassium diffuses out of the cell through potassium leakage channels down its concentration gradient. So remember that leakage channels will always be open. 
Okay. Uh, we have negatively charged proteins inside the cell that cannot leave. So because of that, the cytoplasmic or the internal part of the cell uh, membrane becomes more negative. Okay. So we have positive potassium leaving, but we have these negatively charged proteins or anions that are stuck inside the cell. Okay. So because we have opposite charges here, those opposite charges will attract. Okay. So positive potassium will be pulled back by the more negative interior because of that electrical gradient, that electrical difference. Okay, so when the drive for potassium to leave the cell is balanced by its drive to stay, the resting membrane potential is established. All right, so the electrochemical gradient of potassium sets the resting membrane potential. So in many cells, sodium also impacts the resting membrane potential. Sodium is attracted to the inside of the cell because of those negatively charged proteins that are stuck inside the cell. Um, if sodium enters the cell, it can bring the resting membrane potential up to negative 70 millivolts. Okay? Membrane is more permeable to potassium than sodium, so potassium is the main player for resting membrane potential. Uh, we will be dealing with chlorine anions a little bit as well but they don't influence resting membrane potential because the concentration outside and inside the cell, along with the electrical gradients, are exactly balanced. Okay, and this is just kind of going through that. Um, I recommend going over this diagram, okay? So it's just a visual of what we were just talking about. All right, so the resting membrane potential is maintained through the action of the sodium potassium pump, which continuously ejects three sodium ions out of the cell and brings two potassium ions back inside. Okay, so we have a steady state that's being maintained because of the rate of this active pumping of the sodium out of the cell, um, it equals the rate of the sodium diffusion into the cell. So we have the neuron and the muscle cells upset uh, this steady state of resting membrane potentials because we have gated ion channels. Okay, we mentioned that before whenever we mentioned channels um, in part one of these slides. Um, and they come into play here, especially with the neuron and muscle cells. When we get into it, we'll talk about um, how sodium and potassium influences um, the actions that happen with neurons and muscle cells. All right. Cell environment interactions. Cells interact with their environment by responding directly to other cells or indirectly to extracellular chemicals. So uh, remember that we have this glycocalyx that surrounds the cell. It's this sugary coating, okay? So these interactions will always involve that sugar coat, okay? Uh, so that includes the cell adhesion molecules and the plasma membrane receptors. Anyways, so what's the role of cell adhesion molecules? Every cell has thousands of sticky glycoprotein cams projecting from the membrane. Okay, we have several functions for it. They serve to anchor the cell to the extracellular matrix or to each other. They assist in movements of the cell past one another. They attract white blood cells to injured or infected areas. They stimulate synthesis or degradation of adhesive membrane junctions. Okay, so we talked about tight junctions, we talked about gap junctions, and we talked about uh, desmosomes. Okay, so all of these have a role here. Um, and then cell adhesion molecules also transmit intracellular signals to direct cell migration. Cell adhesion molecules also work to transmit intracellular signals to direct cell migration, proliferation, and specialization. Okay, so what are the roles of these plasma membrane receptors? So they serve for binding, or they serve as binding sites for several chemical signals. We have contact signaling, so cells that touch each, that touch recognize each other based on each cell's unique surface membrane receptors. Um, this is a big deal when it comes to immunity. 
So if we have a bacteria that comes in and it lacks those receptors whenever it's touching another cell that's inside the body, um, that will send off some red flags and that will get the immune system involved. Okay. The second type of signaling is chemical signaling. That is the interaction between receptors and ligands, which are chemical messengers that cause changes in cellular activities. So in some cells, the binding triggers enzyme activation. In others, it opens up chemically gated ion channels. Okay, so ligands, you need to know that those mean chemical messengers, uh, and they include neurotransmitters, hormones, and paracrines. Okay, a little bit more detail about chemical signaling. The same ligand can cause different responses in different cells depending on the chemical pathway that the receptor is a part of. So when the ligand binds, the receptor protein changes shape and thereby becomes activated. Some activate receptors become enzymes, some open or close ion gates, um, and because we're working with ions, we're working with charges, we cause a change in excitability. Okay, so that will be significant again whenever we talk about muscles and neurons. Okay, so activated G-protein-linked receptors indirectly cause cellular changes by activating G-proteins, which then in turn can affect ion channels, activate other enzymes, or cause release of internal second messenger channels such as cyclic AMP. Okay, remember for AMP, we have ATP. When that degrades, it becomes ADP. When that degrades, it becomes AMP, okay, uh, or calcium, all right, to finish that off. So cyclic AMP or calcium. Okay, so G proteins act as a middleman or relays between extracellular first messengers and intracellular second messengers that cause responses within the cell. So step one, the ligand, the first messenger, binds to the receptor. Okay, if we're following along with the diagram here, we are here. Okay, so we have a ligand, a chemical messenger, that's in the extracellular fluid that binds to a receptor that is on uh, the plasma membrane. So step two, okay? So now if we're following along, we're here, okay? The activated receptor binds to a G protein, which is here, and activates. Step three, okay, so now we're over here. The activated G protein activates or inactivates an effector protein, okay? We can see that that is a transmembrane protein that is in the phospholipid bilayer um, and causes it to change shape, okay? So that G protein comes in, attaches to the effector protein um, and causes its shape to change. So step four, now we're here on the diagram, the affected effector enzymes catalyze reactions that produce second messengers in the cell, okay? So catalyze, uh, we're lowering the activation energy necessary for those reactions that produce secondary messengers in the cell uh, to occur. So step five, now we're down here. The second messengers activate other enzymes or ion channels. Step six, we have the kinase enzymes activate other enzymes. Okay. All right, guys, so moving on to part C of chapter three. Okay, so let's discuss the cytoplasm. All cellular material is located between the plasma membrane and the nucleus. Okay, so the, the cytoplasm is made up of all of that. Okay, so we have the cytosol, which is the gel-like solution made up of water and soluble molecules. Okay, inclusion, so insoluble molecules. Um, these are typically going to be smaller, okay? Uh, organelles, think mitochondria, nucleus, all of that. Um, all three of these components are included in the cytoplasm, okay? So cytoplasmic organelles. We have membrius. By membrius, we mean things that have a membrane, okay? So the mitochondria, the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus, um, Peroxomes, lysosomes, um, ribosomes, 
The non-membrous organelles include the ribosomes, cytoskeleton, and the centrioles. Okay, so the membranes allow compartmentalization, which is crucial to cell functioning. Okay, so we have the cell itself that's surrounded by a membrane, and then we also have some organelles that also have a membrane, although it won't be the exact same kind that surrounds the cell. Okay, so the mitochondria, let's start, let's start here, okay? So it's called the power plant of the cell because they produce most of the ATP via anaerobic or oxygen requiring cellular respiration. That's why oxygen makes up so such a large portion of um, our atomic components, okay? So mitochondria, we have double membranes, all right? So the inner membrane has a lot of folds, they're called cristae, okay? So they're embedded within the membrane proteins that play a role in cellular respiration. Mitochondria contain their own DNA, RNA, and ribosomes. That's significant whenever it comes to uh, determining the identity of someone, okay? Um, so we have DNA inside the nucleus, and then we also have mitochondria that have their own DNA, okay? So these look like bacteria. They're capable of the same type of cell division that bacteria use, which is fusion. Or they resemble bacteria, and they're capable of the same type of cell division as bacteria, and that is called fission. Okay? So this is what the mitochondria look like. All right? So we have the cristae here. There are these nice folds. We have the matrix that kind of fills in the space here. We have some DNA, enzymes that kind of pollute um, the cristae, the membrane folds, right? We have some ribosomes as well. Okay, so what are ribosomes? They are non membranous organelles are at the site of protein synthesis. So we'll talk about um, transcription, translation. Both of those are key steps in forming proteins, and ribosomes play a key role during that process. So they're made up of protein and ribosomal RNA. Okay, so RNA will be single-stranded while DNA has double strands. Okay, so we have two different forms that are found inside the cell. We have free ribosomes, which are free-floating, they're the cytosynthesis, of soluble proteins that function in the cytosol or in other organelles. And then we have membrane-bound ribosomes. Okay, so they're attached to the membrane. Keep in mind that even though they're membrane-bound, they don't have membranes themselves. Okay, so they're attached to the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum or the ER. These are the site of synthesis of proteins to be incorporated into membranes or lysosomes or exported from the cell. Okay, so next we have the endoplasmic reticulum, which is the ER. This consists of a series of parallel interconnected cisterns. The cisterns are flattened membranous tubes that enclose fluid-filled interiors, okay? So it's continuous with the outer nuclear membrane. And once we take a look at the cell again, we'll be able to really um, see how that structure correlates with the membrane of the nucleus, okay? So we have two different types, all right? And these are both very significant. So we have the rough ER that has ribosomes um, on the outside of it, and we have the smooth ER which lacks ribosomes. Okay, so this is kind of the difference between the smooth ER and the rough ER. You can see that the smooth ER doesn't appear to be as structural as the rough ER, but the rough ER has ribosomes while the smooth doesn't. Okay, and we'll talk about the impact that those ribosomes have uh, in determining the difference between the smooth ER and the rough ER. Okay. So the rough ER, uh, again, like I mentioned before, it looks rough, quote-unquote rough, because it has ribosomes attached to it. So what happens here? The rough ER serves as the site of synthesis of proteins that will be secreted from the cell, and it's also the site of synthesis for many plasma membrane proteins and phospholipids. Okay, so phospholipids think the same thing that make up the plasma membrane of the cell. Okay? So the proteins that enter the cisterns as they are synthesized and they're modified as they wind through fluid-filled tubes. Okay, so remember the cell, the inside of the cell itself, um, has water as the main solvent. 
Okay, so that's what it means by fluid-filled tubes. Typically, it's going to be that fluid that fills the inside of the cell. Okay, so the final protein is enclosed in the vesicle or in a vesicle and sent to the Golgi apparatus for further processing. Okay, so the rough ER plays another major role when it comes to protein uh, synthesis and travel. What about the smooth ER? So the smooth ER is a network of loop tubules that are continuous with the rough ER, okay? So like our image showed earlier, they are attached to each other. The enzyme is found in the plasma membrane. Um, these are transmembrane proteins, so they're integral proteins. They function in lipid metabolism, so cholesterol um, and steroid-based hormone synthesis, and they also make lipids for lipid proteins. Next, we have absorption, synthesis, and transport of fats. All right, we have the detoxification of certain chemicals, uh, converting of glycogen to free glucose. We have the storage and release of calcium as well. Okay, so the sarcoplasmic reticulum is also going to be key whenever we start talking about the cardiac and skeletal smooth. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is also going to be really important. Uh, it's a specialized smooth uh, endoplasmic reticulum that is found just in skeletal and cardiac muscle cells. Moving on, we have the Golgi apparatus. So this is stacked and flattened membranous certain stacks. Um, it modifies, concentrates, and packages proteins and lipids received from the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Um, so how does it do that? Typically, um, so how does it do that? We have three steps involved in this process. So number one, we have the transport of vesicles from the endoplasmic reticulum. They fuse with the cis or the inner face of the Golgi apparatus. The second step, we have proteins or lipids taken inside um, and they are further modified, tagged, sorted, and packaged. Okay, so here we're becoming more organized in step two. Okay. So three, the Golgi apparatus acts as a traffic director, um, meaning that it controls which of the three pathways final products take um, as new transport vesicles pinch off trans or outer face. Okay, so this is what that looks like. All right, so we have some steps going on here. Okay, so the Golgi apparatus all right, we have this. We have vesicles coming in from the rough endoplasmic reticulum. We're starting here. Okay. So we can see that the outer face, if we take a little closer look here, we can see that it's closer to the plasma membrane of the cell. Okay. So depending on the contents, the final transport vesicle can take one of three pathways. We have pathway A, which involves secretory vesicles. Um, uh, these vesicles contain proteins that can be used outside of the cell. All right, and so like we mentioned before, with these specific uh, vesicles, they can or they will fuse with the plasma membrane um, and perform exocytosis, um, pushing those contents out into the extracellular fluid. Okay, so that's pathway A. Pathway B, we have vesicles containing lipids or transmembrane proteins fused with the plasma membrane or organelle membrane, uh, which insert the contents directly into the destination membrane. Okay, so here we're again looking for membranes, which makes sense whenever we looked at the Golgi apparatus's position inside the cell. Okay, so next we have pathway C, we have the lysosomes. Uh, they contain digestive enzymes, they remain in the cell, uh, they hold the contents in the vesicle until uh, they're needed. Okay, so breaking a few steps down. Okay, so step one. All right, how do we process, how do we distribute um, these new proteins? So step one, the vesicles move from the ER, the rough ER, to the Golgi apparatus. Okay. Step two, these proteins are now modified inside the Golgi apparatus. 
step three, these proteins will be distribu distributed. Okay. So now we're kind of getting into what kind of pathway are they going to take? Pathway A, B, or C. Okay. So we have the proteins for secretion, which would be pathway A. Pathway B would be proteins that are destined for membranes. And pathway C are digestive enzymes that work with the lysosomes. Okay, so the peroxisomes, okay, so now we're getting kind of into peroxide. We've all heard about hydrogen peroxide, um, and now we are going to be going into how hydrogen peroxide interacts with cells, okay? You probably have hydrogen peroxide um, under your bathroom sink, for example. So, what are peroxisomes? They are membrane sacs containing powerful detoxifying substances that neutralize toxins. So when we talk about toxins, we have to talk about free radicals. So free radicals are toxic, they're really reactive, um, a common one happens with oxygen. Um, so they're really toxic, they're natural byproducts. Um, because they're toxic, they can be really damaging to a cell if we don't get those um, neutralized. Okay, so we have two different types of detoxifiers. We have, we have oxidase, uh, which uses oxygen to convert toxins to hydrogen peroxide, um, or we could use catalase, which converts hydrogen peroxide into water. Okay, um, peroxisomes also play a role in the breakdown and synthesis of fatty acids. Okay, fatty acids. Never mind. Okay, so what are lysosomes? We've talked a lot about lysosomes just in passing um, as we work through these slides. So, what are they exactly though? They are spherical membrane bags containing digestive enzymes. Okay? So, they're considered safe sites because they isolate potentially harmful intracellular, intra meaning inside, digestion from the rest of the cell. They digest ingested bacteria, viruses, and toxins ingested meaning ingested by the cell okay they degrade non-functional organelles so if something happens um, if we have a cell that has more than one mitochondria okay and something happens to one of it the lysosome is able to come through and degrade that non-functional organelle okay otherwise if we didn't get rid of that it would just be taking up unneeded space okay it would be overall damaging to the function of the cell okay so next, we have metabolic functions. What do lysosomes do? Um, they break down and release glycogen, and they break down and release calcium from bone. Okay? They also participate in the intracellular release in injured um, cells, causes the cells to digest themselves. Okay? So autolysis. All right? So cells are very aware of kind of their overall health. If something happens and they're not able to repair it, they will digest themselves. Okay, and that's what they look like. Okay, so let's talk about clinical settings. Uh, what function do your lysosomes perform here that are so significant? Okay, so lysosomal storage diseases result when one or more lysosomal digestive enzymes are mutated and it can't function properly. Okay, so we have the Tay Sachs disease, um, which is a condition in which the patient lacks a lysomal enzyme needed to break down the glycolipids inside their brain cells, uh, which obviously will interfere with their overall nervous system functioning. Okay, and we also have um, some people that it tends to affect the most. Okay. All right, so moving on to the endomembrane system. This consists of membrane organelles that we have talked about so far um, and the nuclear and plasma membranes. So basically everything that has a membrane, we're talking about that here, okay? So these membranes and organelles work together to produce, degrade, store, and expert biological molecules and degrade potentially harmful substances. Okay, so this is some of the uh, membranes. Okay, so we have the nuclear envelope. Um, 
basically anything that has a membrane, we're talking about it now. Alright, so what's the cytoskeleton? You mentioned that a little bit before as well. The cytoskeleton is an elaborate network of rods that run through the cytosol. There are a lot of different kinds of proteins that work together to do this. All right, so remember, whenever we first introduced proteins, we talked about how important they are when it comes to uh, structural properties. Okay, so they also act as the cells' bones, ligaments, and muscle. All right, um, by playing a role in the movement of cell components. And we have three types, uh, three different components to the cytoskeleton. We have microfilaments, intermediate filaments, and microtubules. To start with, we have microfilaments. Okay, One of the key things that I want you guys to take away here is realizing the differences in proteins between these three different uh, type of cytoskeletal elements. Okay, So for microfilaments, it's the thinnest and it's made of actin. Okay. Actin will be very important whenever we talk about muscle cells. All right, so each cell has a unique arrangement of strands, um, although share the common terminal web. All right, so what's a terminal web? It's dense. It's a cross-linked network of microfilaments that are attached to the cytoplasmic side of the plasma membrane. Okay, so what do I mean when I say cytoplasmic? Meaning it's facing the inner component of the cell, the cytoplasm. Okay, we're not facing the extracellular fluid. Okay, or inwards towards an organelle. Okay, we're facing the cytoplasm now. Um, the terminal web also strengthens cell surface and helps to resist compression. All right, so some are involved in cell motility, changes in cell shape, or endocytosis and exocytosis. Okay, again. Actin will be a very big deal whenever we talk about um, especially skeletal muscle. Okay, so here's what that looks like. Keep in mind, microfilaments are the thinnest. Okay, these are the thinnest. Okay, so here we're talking about the intermediate filaments. So the size is exactly what it sounds like. It's intermediate between microfilaments and microtubules. Okay, so we have tough, insoluble, rope-like protein fibers. They're composed of tretramere fib fibrils twisted together that make one strong fiber. Okay, these help with resisting pulling forces. All right, um, some have special names like neurofilaments, keratin filaments, um, especially in epithelial cells. Okay, so here's what that would look like. Remember, tetramere, tetra meaning four. Next, we have microtubules. So here we have, uh, they're composed of tubulins. Okay, they're the largest here. They consist of hollow tools, tubes, um, and they are constantly being assembled and disassembled. Okay, so most of them come from the citrosome area of the cell. Uh, these determine the overall shape of the cell and distribution of organelles. Uh, many of them are tethered to microtubules to keep the organelles in place. Okay, so remember that these are the largest, so of course they would have a really key role in keeping these organelles where they belong. Okay, so many substances are moved throughout the cell by motor proteins, which use microtubules as tracks. Okay, motor proteins are also a very big deal. Um, whenever it comes to muscle cells. Okay, and here's what that looks like. Okay, so next we have motor proteins. These are powered by ATP. Remember, ATP is our energy molecule. Okay, our high energy molecule. Alright, and motor proteins, they help with exactly what they sound like, they help with moving, okay? They can help in movement of organelles and other substances around the cell. Okay, the centrosome and the centrioles. The centrosome is located near the nucleus and it means cell center, okay? It is a microtubule organizing center, which is great because that is a component of the cytoskeleton. 
uh, which consists of a granule matrix and centrals. Okay, what are centrals? Uh, they are a pair of barrel shaped microtubule organelles that lie at right angles to each other. So right angles, 90 degrees. Okay, so newly assembled microtubules radiate from the centrosome to the rest of the cell. Okay, so they kind of spawn uh, from this centrosome. Some microtubules aid in cell division, some form the cytoskeletal tract system. So the centrals form the basis of the cilia and flagella, which we'll talk about uh, whenever we talk about cell movement. Okay, so here's what this looks like. Okay, here's another image as well. Okay, so moving on to cellular extensions. Uh, the cilia and flagella, they aid in the movement of the cell or of materials across the surface of the cell. You can also see these really well in um, protists, okay? In those little unicellular eukaryotic organisms, they move very well by cilia and flagella, okay? So the microvilli are finger-like projections that extend from the surface of the cell to increase surface area. So think the small intestine. Okay, I mentioned before that the small intestine has a really large surface area, and it's because of those microvilli. Okay, so the cilia are whip-like modal extensions of surfaces of certain cells, okay, such as the respiratory cells. So this is really good for moving mu mucus along for whenever you breathe stuff in, um, it'll travel it down the throat, okay. So thousands of cilia work together in a sweeping motion to move substances across cell surfaces in one direction. For mucus, it would be down our pharynx, okay, the back of our throat. Flagella are longer, are longer extensions that propel the whole cell. Sperm is the human example of this, okay. Uh, some bacteria also have flagella, all right. So both of these structures are made up of microtubules synthesized by the centrals that are called basal bodies um, because they're, they form the base of each cilium and flagellum. Okay, basal bodies. Um, when we talk about histology in the upcoming lectures and when you talk about tissues, um, we'll talk about like the basal part of the cell. Basal meaning bottom, okay, where that base is is the basal side. Okay, so here are some patterns. All right, so this is talking about the patterns for the microtubules. Uh, we won't focus too much on this, but here's the pattern, okay? Uh, the cilia movements alternate between power stroke and recovery stroke. Um, this produces a current at the cell surface that moves the substances forward. Okay, remember that the cilia moves um, the substances in just one direction. Okay, so this is what that looks like. All right, so this is the power versus the recovery stroke. Okay. All right, microvilli, to go into a little bit more detail about them, they're minute finger-like extensions of the plasma membrane that project from the surface of certain cells. Okay, so I mentioned before, think uh, the small intestine. They have some microvilli. We'll be viewing that for um, our histology lab next week, okay, or whenever we discuss it next. So it's used to increase the surface area for absorption, and they have a core of active microfilaments that are used for stiffening the projection. Okay, so when we view something like celiac disease, okay, um, where we have kind of a malfunction, a mutation of the microvilli of the cells in uh, the small intestine, that line the small intestine, um, there's an issue with the active microfilaments because those projections are unable to stiffen, okay? Instead, when we compare the two slides, so a, so a normal histology slide from the small intestine, where I have the microvilli uh, nice and curvy, 
If we look at the one from someone with celiac disease, you would see that the microfilaments or the um, microvilli are actually flattened, completely flat. Okay. Okay, so this is an image of what they look like. On to part three, which is the nucleus. The nucleus is the largest organelle. It contains most of our genetic material, except for that that is included in the mitochondria. Okay, um, and it's the blueprint, the blueprints for its synthesis of nearly all of our proteins. Okay, and the nucleus responds to the signals that dictate the kinds and the amounts of proteins that they need to be synthesized. Most cells are uninucleate, okay, meaning that they only have one nucleus. But skeletal muscle, certain bone cells, and some liver cells are called multinucleate, meaning that they have more than one nucleus. Okay? Red blood cells have no nucleus, though. So red blood cells have no genetic information um, in terms of a nucleus. Okay, so let's talk about the structure of the nucleus. The nucleus has three main structures. We have the nuclear envelope, the nucleoli, and chromatin. Okay, so this is the overall image of the nucleus. Make sure you're able to study this. This is also on your homework, kind of going into the pores uh, versus the chromatin versus the envelope, nucleolus, all of that. Okay, and we can also see that the rough ER is right next to it. Okay, which makes sense when we start to talk about protein synthesis. The nuclear envelope, okay. The nucleus is surrounded by a double membrane barrier, all right? Um, it encloses jelly-like fluid that kind of makes up the nucleus called the nucleoplasm. The outer layer is continuous with the rough ER and has ribosomes. The inner layer is called the nuclear lamina, which that is a key word. Whenever we talk about histology, we'll talk about that word, uh, the lamina, a lot, okay? So really the lamina just means like an empty space, okay? It is a network of mesh of proteins that contains or that maintains nuclear shape and acts as scaffolding for DNA. Okay, and then studying the outside of this nuclear envelope, we have nuclear pores. They allow substances that to pass into and out of the nucleus. They're guarded by the nuclear pore complex. Uh, the nuclear pore complex works to regulate the transportation of certain large molecules. Okay, so this is a specific complex. All right, so this is some images of the nucleus. Moving on to the nucleoli, that is dark staining spherical bodies within the nucleus that are involved in RNA synthesis and ribosome subunit assembly. Okay, so this is gonna be really important once we get into how protein synthesis works. All right, and the nucleoli is also associated with the nuclear, um, nucleolar, nucleolar the nucleoli is also associated with the nucleolar organizer regions uh, that contain the dna that codes for our rna which again we'll discuss when we get into protein synthesis okay so uh, we usually only have one or two of these per cell okay so the third part of the nucleus is chromatin this consists of 30 percent red like strands of dna 60% histone proteins and 10% RNA. Okay, histone is also a very key component uh, whenever we look at the immune system and immune system responses. Okay, um, chromatin is arranged in function in fundamental units called nucleosomes, which consists of DNA wrapped around histosomes. Okay, or histones. <sighs> chromatin is arranged in functional units called nucleosomes, which consist of DNA that are wrapped around histones. Okay, uh, chemical alterations of histones have an effect on DNA and therefore can help regulate gene expression. All right, so now we're getting into uh, where mutations kind of come into play. Okay, so chromosomes are condensed chromatin. Okay, they are in a condensed state that helps protect the fragile chromatin threads during cellular division, which we'll talk about uh, soon, okay? All right, so here's what this looks like. We have DNA, 
All right, next we have chromatin. Okay. All right, going a little bit more um, into this, we'll talk about what happens to the chromosome um, when we get into cellular division. Okay, so moving into the last part of chapter three. So let's discuss the cell cycle. Okay, so the cell cycle is a series of changes that a cell undergoes from the time that it's formed until it reproduces. We have two major cycles that will, or two major periods of the cycle that we'll be looking at. We have interphase in which it grows and carries on its usual activity, so it's not dividing yet. Okay, interphase happens when no division is occurring. Okay, so it's growing, it's doing what it needs to do. All right, so now we have the mitotic phase, which is also where cell division takes place. The cell will divide into two, okay, two daughter cells. So interphase, this is the period from cell formation to division when the cell carries out its routine activity and prepares for cell division, okay? Um, the whole purpose of life is reproducing uh, for the most part, okay? Um, that includes cells. So cells want to divide, all right, to carry on their genetic material to the next generation, okay? So during interphase, nuclear material is in an in uncondensed chromatin state, okay? So we don't have chromosomes here, okay? So interphase consists of subphases, which include DNA replication. Okay, so here are our subphases. We have interphase that's broken down into three subphases. We have G1 or GAP1. We have a lot of growth in metabolism, okay? So cells that permanently cease dividing are in G0 phase. We have S, which is where DNA replication occurs, and we have G2, where it starts to prepare for division. Okay, and this is a very common cell cycle diagram. Okay, so interphase, uh, to continue forward, DNA replication, now we're in the S phase, okay? So right before division, the cell makes a copy of the DNA. The double-stranded DNA, helixes, unwind and unzip. We'll talk about the type of enzymes that help that occur, okay? So first we have the replication fork, which is the point where the strands separate. Next we have the replication bubble, which is the active area of replication. Um, there are some really good videos that should be already posted that show a really good uh, process of how this occurs, how DNA replication occurs. Each strand acts as a template for a new complementary strand. Uh, RNA starts replication by laying down a short strand that acts as a primer. Okay. So, talking about enzymes now, we have DNA polymerase. Okay, DNA polymerase attaches to the primer and begins adding nucleotides to form a new strand. Okay, so the DNA polymerase synthesizes new strands one at a time. We have a leading strand and a lagging strand. And once you see the image, um, you'll really see where they get the names leading and lagging. Okay, so the DNA polymerase works only in one direction. The leading strand is always being continuously synthesized. Okay, the lagging strand um, is called lagging because it's synthesized into segments kind of discontinually. Okay, kind of fragmented. So next, we have another enzyme. We have DNA ligase that splices the short segments of continuous lagging strand pieces together, okay? So we have two different enzymes that we're talking here. We have polymerase that starts to add nucleotides, and then we have ligase that puts together the lagging strand. Okay, what's the end result of this? We have two identical daughter DNA molecules that are formed from the original, okay? Remember, we're in S phase, we're doing DNA replication, okay? So during metodic cell division, we have two different types of cell division. This will be producing identical daughter cells. Then we have meiosis, which will be focusing with sex cells, okay? So during mitotic cell division, we have one complete copy that will be given to a new cell while one is retained in the original cell.
Okay, so remember, we're preparing for cell division. Okay, that is why we are doing DNA replication. So this process is called semi-conservative replication because each new double-stranded DNA is composed of one old strand and one new strand. Okay, and this is a really good um, image of what this looks like. Okay, so we have an enzyme here that's unwinding the DNA. Okay, we have DNA polymerase that's adding on nucleotides here. Okay, we have another DNA polymerase that's doing the same to the lagging strand. Okay, and then we'll have um, DNA ligase come through and put together the pieces of the lagging strand. Okay, so cell division. Um, most cells need to keep replicating continuously for growth and repair. Um, if there is an issue with a cell, then it can be repaired, all right? Um, with the exception of a few. So skeletal, cardiac, and nerve cells don't divide well. They replace the scar tissue instead, okay? So now that we've gone through G1, which is rapid growth uh, and development, we're doing S, which would be DNA replication. G2 is the stage right before we're actually dividing, okay? So we're getting ready ready to perform cell division. Now we're in M phase, which is mitotic phase of the cell cycle. Um, and this phase is where of course division occurs. We have two different events. We have mitosis and cytokinesis. Cytokinesis, cyto meaning cell, kinesis meaning movement, okay? So the control of cell division is crucial so cells will divide when necessary, but don't need to divide always, okay? So it's very important that we don't have out of control cell division. Um, if we do, think something like cancer, okay? Um, I mentioned before with chemistry, the terms energetically efficient, energetically inefficient, okay? So, if we don't need to waste that energy because we don't need to divide, then we're not going to, okay? All right, this is just to go back over that image of the cell cycle. Okay, so the end phase. Mitosis is division of the nucleus in which the duplicated DNA is distributed to new daughter cells. We have four different stages of mitosis to make sure that each cell receives a full copy of the replicated DNA. We start with prophase. The easiest way to remember that prophase is one is that pro means before. Okay, so prophase. We have metaphase, anaphase, and then telophase. All right, prophase has two different parts. To begin with, we have early prophase. Okay, one of the things I want to back up for just a second. One of the things that I want you guys to really be able to take away from this and be able to use as study material is by looking at diagrams, okay? Understanding it whenever it looks like this, whenever it's just written down as words is great, but being able to get that visual representation is really great as well, okay? So back to early prophase. We have the chromatin condensing, which forms invisible chromosomes, okay? Remember, chromosomes are made up of chromatin. Before this, they were not together, okay? We did not have chromosomes. But now, chromatin is condensing, we're forming chromosomes, okay? So each chromosome and its duplicate, we have sister chromatids, are held together by a centromere, okay? Centromere, think center, okay? The centrosome and its duplicate begin synthesizing microtubules that push each centrosome to opposite poles of the cell. This is the mitotic spindle. Other microtubules called asters radiate from the centrosome. Okay? So I know that this is a lot, but we'll be able to go through um, and see diagrams, and those diagrams really help. I really recommend drawing those out. Okay? So step two, we have uh, late prophase. Here we have the nuclear envelope breaking up. Okay? 
uh, the special microtubules attached to the specific area on centromeres called the kinetic pore um, and serve to, pour, to pull centrosomes to the center of the cell. Okay, so now we're moving towards the center. Before, in early prophase, we were moving towards the pole of the cell. Okay, uh, the remaining non-connected pore uh, microtubules push against each other, pulling poles of the cell to move further apart. Okay, so this is interphase. Um, remember, interphase, um, we're just having normal functionings happening. We're growing, we're not dividing, okay? Not yet. Okay, so this is prophase. This is early prophase. Okay, and late prophase. Okay, so you can see kind of the difference going on here. Okay, next we have metaphase. The centromeres of the chromosomes are exactly at the cell's equator. Okay, uh, and this is called the metaphase plate. Okay, so this is getting a lot more organized, right? You can see that we have this equator going on here. Okay, this is the metaphase plate, right? And we have all those centromeres of the chromosomes exactly at the cell's equator. Okay. Next, we have anaphase. This is a short phase. Okay, the centromeres of the chromosomes split up simultaneously. Each sister chromatid now becomes a separate chromosome. Okay, um, so the chromatids remember that um, each chromosome is made up of chromatids. Okay, so the chromosomes are pulled towards their respective poles by motor proteins of the kinetochores. Okay. One chromosome of each original pair goes to opposite poles. The non-kinetic cord microtubules continue forcing the poles apart. Okay, so again, I think it's really good to go through and take a look at these images. Okay, I really want you guys to focus on these images. Okay, so if we go back and just take a quick second to compare these two images. Okay, you can see here we have some splitting occurring between the daughter chromosomes and before they were together, okay? Okay, the last stage, we have telophase. Um, this begins with the chromosome movement stops. Each side of the chromosomes uncoils to form chromatin, okay? Remember, chromosomes are made up of chromatin, but now they're uncoiling and now they're just chromatin, okay? The new nuclear membranes form around each chromatin mass, Nucleoli reappear and the spindle disappears. Okay, so now we're winding down the cell division. So cytokinesis begins during late in the phase and continues through mitosis. Uh, the ring of actin microfilaments contracts to form a cleavage pharaoh, uh, and two daughter cells are pinched apart here. Okay, so now we can see telophase and cyto. Kinesis. Okay, so how is cell division controlled? We have go and stop signals that direct when a cell should and shouldn't divide. Uh, what signals tell us when to go? Okay, um, so go signals include critical surface to volume ratios of the cell. Um, when the area of the membrane becomes inadequate for exchange, we have chemicals. Okay, stop signals. Um, is referred to as contact inhibition when this occurs. All right, so if we don't have enough space, normal cells stop dividing when they come into contact with other cells. Okay, um, those those are some stop signals. Two groups of proteins that are crucial to a cell's ability uh, to accomplish S phase and intermitosis. Okay, so we have the cyclins. Those are regulatory proteins that accumulate during interphase. Okay, so interphase again right before mitosis, right? Next we have the CDKs, all right? So these are a type of enzymes. They activate cyclins whenever they bind to them, okay? So cyclin, the cyclin CDK complex activates enzyme um, cascades that prepare the cell for division, okay? So cascades meaning one after the other. And the cyclins, those regulatory proteins are destroyed 
after metodic cell division, and that process begins again. It's a cycle. Okay, so where are the chi the so where are the checkpoints? They're key events in the cell cycle where cell division processes are checked, and if they're faulty, they're stopped until those repairs are being able to be made. Okay, so we have the G1 checkpoint, the restriction point, really, really important. Okay, um, so remember that the G1 stage is where rapid cell growth occurs. Okay, um, if it fails this, then it enters G0, in which no further um, division occurs. Okay, so this is really important so we don't pass down uh, cells that are damaged. Okay. Is all about energy as well. Why would we move forward with going through the cell division process if we don't even have the necessary repairs being made, if the cell isn't healthy enough for cell division to occur? Okay, and again, this is the cell cycle. Make sure you're aware of this. Okay, so we talked about cell division. Now let's jump into protein synthesis. Okay, so DNA is the master blueprint that holds the code for protein synthesis. Um, the DNA directs the order of amino acids in a polypeptide. Right, a segment of DNA that holds the code for one polypeptide is referred to as a gene. Okay, so the code is determined by the specific order of nitrogen bases. We have adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine in the gene. Okay, so whenever you do your homework on your exam, we need to talk about which bases pair up, okay, during uh, protein synthesis and DNA replication. Okay, so the code consists of three sequential bases, which is called a triplet code, okay, and each one of these. Um, these combination of three different bases will code for a different amino acid, okay? You are not responsible for knowing each amino acid, okay? So just keep that in mind. Each triplet specifies the code for a particular amino acid, like I mentioned, okay? So genes are composed of exons and introns. Introns are non-coding segments. Um, so whenever we start to do uh, protein synthesis, these won't really be considered. They're just not important in terms of coding. Okay, next we have exons. These are part of the genes that actually code for. Okay, so the role of RNA. RNA is the go-between molecule that leaks DNA uh, to proteins. So um, we'll talk about where each one of these are formed. We have three different types. We have messenger RNA, ribosomal RNA, and transfer RNA. Okay, so RNA, RNA, so RNA is a little bit different from DNA. Um, whenever it comes to those nitrogenous bases that we mentioned before, so instead of using thymine, um, we use uracil in RNA. Um, another thing that's different is that sugar. Okay, so we talked a little bit before about how DNA is composed of deoxyribose as the sugar, while RNA has ribose. Okay and all RNA is going to be formed in the nucleus. Okay, messenger RNA is single-stranded. Um, the code from the DNA template strand is copied with complementary base pairs, which makes mRNA. Okay, and this is transcription. So for transcription, we go from DNA to mRNA. Okay, the mRNA maintains the triplet code from the DNA. Okay, ribosomal RNA. We have the structural component of ribosomes. Okay, recall back from when we discussed ribosomes, ribosomes are the organelle where protein synthesis occurs. Okay, so along with transfer RNA, it helps to translate the message from mRNA, messenger RNA, into a polypeptide, which is a protein. Okay, so transfer RNAs, these are the carriers of amino acids. They have special Areas that code a specific triplet code, an anticodon, that allows each TNA, tRNA to carry only one specific uh, 
amino acid. Okay, and we'll talk about what that anticodon is. All right. So the anticodon for a transfer RNA um, will complement base pair um, or complementary base pair with the codon of messenger RNA at the ribosome which adds a specific amino acid to the polypeptide chain, and this is translation, okay? So, when we talk about protein synthesis, we have two main steps, okay? We have transcription and translation, okay? Like I mentioned before, transcription, translation. Transcription, we have DNA information, is coded into mRNA. Translation is mRNA decoded to make the proteins. Okay, so we also have different locations where this will occur. So transcription will be occurring inside the nucleus, right? And translation will be occurring back in the cytoplasm with these ribosomes. Transcription is the process of transferring code held in DNA gene base sequence uh, to complementary base sequence of mRNA. Uh, we have transcription factors that activate transcription by loosening the histones from DNA in an area to be transcribed so DNA segments can be exposed. Um, we have the binding of special sequences of genes to be transcribed, which are called the promoter point. Okay, and this is only on the DNA template strand, not on the mRNA. Okay, then we have mediating the binding of RNA polymerase, the enzyme that synthesizes mRNA to the promoter region. So recall back whenever we talked about DNA replication, we had DNA polymerase. Okay, RNA polymerase acts pretty similar. But instead of synthesizing DNA, now we're synthesizing messenger RNA. Okay. We have three different phases for transcription. We have initiation in which mRNA. We have initiation in which RNA polymerase separates the DNA strands. Then we have elongation where the polymerase enzyme adds on complementary nucleotides to the growing messenger RNA matching sequence strand um, of based RNA. Let me back that up. Elongation occurs when RNA polymerase adds complementary nucleotides to the growing messenger RNA matching sequence of bases on the DNA to split strand. Okay, and that is referred to as a DNA RNA hybrid. Okay, so step three, or phase three, we have termination. Uh, transcription stops when RNA polymerase reaches a special termination signal code. Okay, so going a little bit more into detail. All right, so the RNA polymerase binds to the promoter region prize apart the two DNA strands and initiates messenger RNA synthesis at the start point within the promoter region. Okay. Step two, we have elongation. So we're moving along this template strand, drawing together the RNA nucleotides that complement the DNA. And next we have termination. Now we're finishing up mRNA um, and we've reached the stopping point the stopping code on here. Okay, so now we're moving on to transcription. Um, here we're processing mRNA. It's newly formed mRNA, uh, which is then edited and processed before translation can begin. Okay, so before this processing occurs, it's called pre-mRNA. Introns are removed by special proteins called splicesomes, um, which leave only the exon coding regions. So we're called back to and if we first introduce this, introns are not relevant when it comes to coding for RNA. Okay, they're non-coding regions. Okay, translation is a step of protein synthesis 
where the language of nucleic acids is translated into the language of proteins. Okay, so now we're dealing with the amino acid sequence. So we need mRNA, genetic code, tRNA and ribosomes, translating events, and sometimes the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, so the genetic code. Each three base sequence on DNA is represented by a complementary three base sequence on mRNA called a codon. We have 64 and they code for an amino acid. Okay, so it really just depends on which one. We have three stop codons, which one of them is UGA. That's a really common one. Uh, we have 20 possible amino acids. Uh, sometimes we have more than one codon can represent just one amino acid. Okay. This is the chart that you will be looking at for that, but you won't be required to memorize this. Okay, so what does tRNA do? So tRNA binds a specific amino acid at one end. Um, once that amino acid is loaded onto the tRNA, now it's called an amino acyl tRNA. Okay. The anticodon on the other end is a triplet code that determines which amino acid will be bound at the stem. Okay. The anticodon of tRNA will bind only to the codon on mRNA that is complementary. Okay. Makes sense for that. All right. So the ribosomes coordinate coupling of mRNA. The ribosomes contain one, bit, one binding site for mRNA and three binding sites for tRNA. Okay. So what are the events for translation? Okay. So we need energy, protein factors, enzymes. Similar to what happened with transcription, we have initiation, elongation, and termination. Okay, so initiation, when does that happen? All right, so initiation, when does that happen? We have a small ribosomal subunit that binds to a special indicator tRNA, then to mRNA to be decoded. Okay, the ribosome scans its mRNA, which looks for a start codon. Okay, when the anticodon of the initiator tRNA binds to a start codon, the large ribosomal unit can then attach to the small ribosomal unit, which forms a functional ribosome. Okay. At the end of initiation, the initiator tRNA is in the P site of ribosome, and the A and E sites are empty. Okay, elongation. We have three steps here: we have codon recognition, peptide bond formation, and translocation. Okay, for your exam, all right, I don't really want to focus too much on each of these sites, okay? I don't think that that should be the key thing that you guys take away from this whenever you talk about protein synthesis. Um, so really what I want you guys to know, transcription, translation, know what initiation, elongation, and termination will mean. Um, but in terms of the specifics for the A site, P site, E site, um, I don't think that that's going to be something that I really want you guys to uh, waste a lot of time studying over. Okay. Okay, so this is just kind of going back through that, talking a little bit about the sites. Okay. So determination. Um, translation stops when it hits the stop codon. Okay. Um, that's really what I want you guys to know about that. Once we hit that stop codon, uh, we're done with translation. We've made the protein. Okay. Um, it will be further processed by other cell structures into an actual functional 3D protein, but we finished doing the baseline you know, forming the amino acid chain, okay? Okay, so what does the rough ER do?
okay? So, um, we have a short amino acid segment that's called the ER signal sequence that is present on a growing polypeptide chain. Um, the signals associated on the ribosome to dock on the rough ER surface. Okay, so once docked, the forming polypeptide enters the ER. Okay, so sugar groups may be added to the protein, its shape may be altered. The protein is then included in the vesicle for transport to the Golgi apparatus. Okay, so this signal, signal, so this diagram is just kind of going through this. I don't want you guys to focus too much on the details. Um, just get the general picture uh, of that whenever it comes to what the rough ER does. Okay. So, a little summary of this. The, the complementary base pairing directs transfer of genetic information in DNA into the amino acid sequence for a protein. So, the DNA triplets coded into messenger RNA codons. The RNA codons are base paired with the T RNA and the codons to ensure correct amino acid sequence. Okay. And make sure that you take away that thymine is not necessary in RNA. Okay. Instead, we use uracil. Okay. So, other roles of DNA. We have uh, microRNA that it codes for, which are small RNAs that combine to and silence mRNAs made by certain exons. And then we have small interfering RNAs, which are similar to microRNAs, but can be used to silence um, messenger RNA from pathogenic sources such as viruses. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what happens when a cell is damaged. Okay, so we have autophagy. Um, cells that have become obsolete or damaged need to be taken out of the system. So it can perform autophagy, which is self-eating. Um, it's the process of disposing of non-functional organelles and sweeping up cytoplasmic bits by forming autophagosomes, which can then be degraded by lysosomes. Okay. So next we have the ubiquitin proteasome pathway, which, um, what does that have to do with, I'm so tired. <sighs> okay. So next we have the ubiquitin proteasome pathway, unneeded, misfolded, or damaged proteins can be marked for destruction by the protein, which is called ubiquitin. We have proteasomes, which disassemble these ubiquitin-targeted proteins, which recycle the amino acids and ubiquitin itself. All right, apoptosis is very significant. This is programmed cell death, which causes certain cells to self-destruct. Okay, so this begins with mitochondrial membranes leaking chemicals that activate enzymes called caspiases. Caspiases cause degradation of DNA and the cytoskeleton, which leads to cell death. This cell death shrinks and is fetishized by macrophages, which are part of the immune system. Alright guys, and that concludes chapter 3.